There we go. Okay, so again, <laughs> welcome to Kabbalah Decoded. Now we are recording. Um, the attribute of wisdom, this class is called Acquiring Wisdom, which is not, it's a little bit of a misnomer actually, because everybody has wisdom, what we're, we're born with it. Uh, it's one of the faculties of the soul. The problem is that wisdom is sometimes in abeyance, so to speak. It's not properly developed, so really we should call it developing wisdom. That's more what um, the class is really about, developing wisdom. And thank you for reminding me about recording. <clears throat> now, um, when we say that everyone is born with wisdom, everybody knows the, um, the, this, the tree of the Sfirot, which is also the tree of the powers of the soul. In other words, the setup, the way the Sfirot are set up, as everybody knows, um, so too the soul has the similar uh, setup. So the power of Chochmah is the first of the imminent powers of the soul. However, the reason that Chochmah needs development, so to speak, it needs to be um, needs to be further um, strengthened, developed, and revealed, is because in its essence, Chochmah is in a state of nothingness most of the time. There's a verse in Job, uh, let me just switch quickly to share screen, here we go, one second, okay. Everyone can see? Yes? Everyone can see that? Uh, can see the share screen? Yeah? Okay, very good. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a verse in Job that says as follows, Wisdom, Chochmah, from where does it come? The verse in Hebrew is, Vaha Chochmah Me'ayin Timotse, which the commentaries explain as meaning, it's a question, it's a um, um, rhetorical question. Wisdom, from where does it come? However, the Kabbalists read it differently. They don't read it as wisdom from where does it come. They read it as chokhmah, wisdom, me'ayin, from nothing it comes. Not because the word from where, in the verse over here, the word from where can also be read, read as from nothing. Me'ayin could mean from where is it. It could also mean, literally, not as a question, but as a statement, me'ayin, it comes from ayin, it comes from nothingness. Wisdom comes from nothingness. What does that mean? It means that wisdom really comes from a transcendent plane. It comes from the it comes from the level of chokhmah. I uh, sorry, from the level of keter. Chokhmah emerges from keter, but it doesn't emerge from keter in a way of what is called in Kabbalah hishtal shalut. It doesn't derive from keter in a way of cause and effect hishtal shalut. It, ar it derives from Keter in a more um, mysterious fashion. It emerges suddenly, it emerges suddenly without, um, um, one, without one being aware of what the source of it is. This is called in Kabbalah, Barak HaMavrik. It's called the lightning flash. That Chochmah flashes in and out of existence. It flashes into tangible or semi-tangible existence and returns to a state of nothingness goes from a higher when we say nothingness it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean there's nothing there it just means a beyond a, a level that's beyond intellectual comprehension it's beyond comprehension beyond grasp the level of keter so chokhmah has this quality all of the time it has the quality of Yesh and the quality of I and the quality of being and not being at the same time, or at least oscillating between being and not being, which is why it's so difficult really to grasp what Chochmah, what wisdom is. To the extent that there's another verse in Job that says that many years will inform wisdom. It takes a, a long, long, long time for wisdom to become really manifest in a person. The story is told of a very unusual incident in uh, in the in the Talmud, 
where um, one uh, with with the previous um, head of the rabbinical court, the Beit Din Sanhedrin, was uh, removed from his position, and the position was then passed on to. They were looking for the proper candidate for the position. One of the candidates for the position was a man named Alaza ben Azaria, Rabbi Alaza ben Azaria. Now, Rabbi Alaza ben Azaria at this time was only, he was very, very young. He was only 18 years old. So he was very unsure about whether he had the wisdom to be able to lead uh, the people. The head of the, the Sanhedrin is the rabbinical court, which is the, like, uh, I suppose perhaps in some way the equivalent would be like the Congress in America, to head the entire Congress, to head the entire rabbinical court, which is the legislator, uh, the legislative branch, and the branch that brings down, uh, also provides a certain amount of leadership, and so on and so forth, makes laws, interprets laws, etc. <clears throat> so he was not sure, even though he was a candidate, he was not sure that he was worthy of the job, and when they offered it to him, he had to think about it, and he went to speak to his wife. He said, let me talk to my wife first, she was obviously a very wise woman. He was married, even though he was very young, but um, he was married. And um, uh, yes, this is the story from the Haggadah, that's correct. Uh, but it is originally in the Gomorrah, actually, um, in the Talmud. So um, he, um, he spoke to his wife about it, and his wife said, well, the problem is, you know, you have learning, you have book wisdom, but you don't have life wisdom because you're too young. You're too young. You had one of life wisdom. A, a, a sage has to have gray in his beard. <laughs> That's what she told him. He has to. He has to be able. The people have to be able to see that he's a sage. In any event, he went to sleep that night, and uh, in the morning he had his beard. His beard or parts of his beard had turned gray, and uh, by that he knew as a sign from heaven that he was worthy of the position. And in fact, he did. He was appointed to the uh, to head the rabbinical court, the Sanhedrin. So in, and that's in a very abnormal case. In the normal case, many, many years will inform wisdom. It takes a long time to develop wisdom. Now, there's another very interesting uh, verse uh, which says as follows, um, a wise person's eyes are in his head. A wise person's eyes are in his head. So the Zohar asks, well, what, like, what, kind of, uh, what kind of statement is that? <laughs> Where else are a person's eyes supposed to be? <laughs> um, why, why do you say that they're in his head? So the Zohar says, well, the, the, the meaning of this is not that, it's not to tell you sort of uh, human anatomy that the eyes of a person are in his head. It comes to inform you that a wise person's a wise person is always looking at that which is above him. When it says, when it says in his head or in his head, the word beroisha could also be written, read in Hebrew, uh, his, ha his eyes are in his head, could also be read as his eyes are upon his head, or rather his eyes are upon that which is upon his head. What is upon his head? The divine presence. A wise person keeps his eyes on the divine presence, so to speak, on the Shechina, the divine presence, which rests upon a person. And that is also the meaning of the verse, that a person's wisdom, it's also from Ecclesiastes Kohelet, a person's wisdom illuminates his face. Chochmas Adam Ta'ir Panav. A person's wisdom illuminates his face. So someone asked a question here, are we talking about... Uh, the third eye. Um, you know, I'm not that familiar with the third eye in Buddhist um, uh, terminologies and so on and so forth that I would be able to give a properly comprehensive answer. We are talking here about not physical vis vision, but spiritual vision. We're talking about spiritual vision. You want to call it the third eye, perhaps it would be the same thing. But it means seeing with the wisdom that there is in, uh, in the soul. The faculty of wisdom is allied to the faculty of sight. The faculty of Chochmah is, is, is called Re'iyah, sight, whereas Bina is called Shmia, hearing. So you'll see that on the chart, on the Sfirot and, and Powers chart that uh, 
that I've sent everybody. Uh, if you if you need it, let me know. I can send it to you, or it's in the lo in the Dropbox. You know, just look for the three rot chart in the Dropbox. Okay, but there's another uh, there's another statement as well, and this is really what we need to uh, focus on. Just let me pull it up here. One second. Um, Yeah, here we go. Um, I'm going to just copy this in Hebrew first onto the, and then I'll translate it. Who is a wise? Who is wise? Who is wise? One who sees, who sees the no light. Now, I left the word in Hebrew, um, and that's from the, it's also from the Talmud called Tamid, Masechta called Tamid, 32a. Okay, that's where it's from. The tractate called Tamid. Now, why did I leave it like this? Who is wise? Question mark. Not exclamation. Who is wise? One who sees the Noilad. Now, because the Noilad has two explanations. There's two explanations of what Noilad means. Uh, Terry says, not what we are looking at, but how we are looking at it. Yes, for sure. Um, it is in thought. Yes, it's in the mind. Uh, and we will discuss this a little bit more further on. Um, uh, it's the lens we're looking through to a certain extent. I'll explain now. So, the, the Talmud asks, who is wise? Who is a wise person? One who sees the nolad. What's the nolad? The nolad means two possible, the two possible interpretations of what nolad is. Nolad could mean what will come to be from something. What will come to be. Nolad could mean what will come to be. Let's move it back a little bit. What will come to be. It could also mean origin the origin of something the nolad means from where it's born right from where it's born so one who sees the nolad a wise person is one who sees what will come to be in other words the consequences he thinks about the consequences of what he does and what the possible ramifications could be of any activity or um, any activity that he does, or any, any speech that he makes, anything that he says, etc. He thinks of what will come to be. On the other hand, there's a much deeper ex explanation, a second explanation. He thinks about the origin of things. Both of these are valid explanations, and both of them have to do with acquiring or developing Chochmah. And we'll explain how that uh, how that works. When a person looks at the possible consequences of what it is that he is doing, what is he actually what 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 is behind that motivation? Behind that motivation is a certain concern that things should not be misunderstood. They should not have negative effects. They should not have, um, should not cause anybody else any harm or difficulty. And they should be, they should accord with the principles that a person holds dear. So, the first step in acquiring wisdom then is to think through. What, what one does, the actions that one does, what could be the end consequence of such a thing? This leads, to, uh, leads a person to be careful about what he says, to certainly be careful about what he does, how he interacts with other people, and whether everything that he thinks and he says and he does are 
in sync with what his most basic principles are. And this is a very important part of, um, of, of wisdom because a wise person is one who does things with truth. He does things that are not out of character with his principles, not out of sync with his principles, with his values. And he's careful, a wise person, he, she, is careful about making sure that there are no negative consequences or ramifications about what it is that the person is, uh, is about to do. So therefore, in order to acquire wisdom, we have to look what's going to be down the road. What is the next step going to be and the step after that, and perhaps the step after that, the consequence after that. Now, as we all know, uh, to be a, a, um, a major chess champion, a person has to think of several moves ahead. Does he know which move his opponent is going to do? No, but he assumes based on what uh, would be logical for his opponent to do, um, which might be three or four different moves, that if he does this particular move, then I'll do that one, and so it goes on. And you can think, a, a real chess champion can think at least four or five moves ahead of, uh, of where he is now, and sometimes even more than that. I mean, we're talking about world chess champions that can move uh, way, way beyond that as well. <clears throat> Six, seven, eight moves ahead and with all the consequences, etc. So we have to think to a certain extent like chess masters, right? We have to think what are the ramifications of if this particular thing comes to be, if I do this particular action, what could be the three or four or five possible consequences in the universe in which I live, in the world around me, and adjust accordingly. Okay, that's all looking at one side of the coin. That's looking at the side of the coin of what will come to be. The other side of the coin is, and we look at the origin of things. What is the origin, uh, based in statistics, not, not classical? Okay, <laughs> fine. Have it, have it. As you wish. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what Bayesian statistics are, but uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Okay, so the um, the other way of looking of translating the word nolad is not what will come to be, but looking at it from the point of view of what is the origin of things. What is the origin of things? Now, the origin of anything, in other words, what are we talking about over here? What we're talking about is the ability to look into the origins, in other words, the, um, sorry, just one second here. The ability to look into the origins, into the spiritual predecessor of any particular idea or concept or existence, anything that exists in the world. One of the, one of the meditations that we're talking about over here, say the, uh, say the Kabbalists, and particularly the Hasidic Kabbalists from the Hasidic uh, line, say that this is the meaning of the verse, Se'u marom eneichem, uru'u mi bara eler, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. With any particular thing that's happening, any event that's happening in the universe, any object that we that one cares to meditate on, and particularly on what's happening with human beings, if one meditates on the antecedents to that, in other words, not the antecedents necessarily in time, but the antecedents in a spiritual sense, what precedes this in spirituality, in other words, if there's a universe around us and we contemplate the universe and we lift up our eyes to the heaven, lift up your eyes on high. On high doesn't mean uh, that, you, that you look upwards into the sky, but it means looking up to a higher level of existence, to a higher plane of existence, to a higher world, to a higher sphere.
Neuland that says Excel above others. Oh, I think yeah, you're talking there about the birth of the new moon, which is related to this, but not exactly what we're talking about now. Maybe if I get a chance, I'll, I'll, I'll segue into that a little bit later. So, uh, when we say the origin of things, lift up your eyes and see, in other words, and gaze upon the origin of things up above on a higher plane of existence. That is what leads a person to wisdom. As we said before, when Chochmah comes out of Ayin, it comes out of nothingness. Wisdom comes out of nothingness. It, in nothingness, it emerges and is developed by contemplating on the nothingness, by contemplating on the Ayin, in other words, the beyond intellectual origin of things the beyond the intellectual origin of things which is called the ayin the nothingness thereof nothingness because we don't know what it is right when we say um the uh, the classical um explanation of the idea of nothingness is when the manna fell in the desert the jewish people in the desert as we know the biblical story of how the manna fell in the desert so the why was it called manna? It was called in Hebrew man, because they didn't know ma'anhu where it came from, what it was. It just sort of appeared, right? They didn't know where it was. It was that was the whole concept of it was really the concept. of manna is the concept of chokhmah. It appeared from nowhere. So um, they called it man kiloya du mahu. They didn't know what it was. Ma. The word ma, uh, just to go back to um, our screen over here, the word ma in Hebrew, oh, sorry. Sorry, I don't know why my computer's making issues here. One second. Okay, here we go. That's the problem with changing languages. Sometimes it wants to speak in English. Okay. So the word ma in Hebrew means, in English, it would be translated as, what is it? Mahu. What is it? Ma. Right? Actually, be like that. Ma. What is it? Okay? Everyone can see it? Now, the word chokhmah itself in Hebrew, the word chokhmah itself in Hebrew is written as the the uh, Tikkunei Zohar, one of the books of the Zohar, explains that the word Chochmah, 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 can be broken into two words, Koach and Ma. Right? So, uh, let's just do this in English as well. Chochmah. Um, Chokhmah can be broken into two words, koach and let's make that a and ma. Right, koach and ma. The word chokhmah therefore would be koach and ma. Koach means power or potential. Power, um, power, potential. And ma, meaning uh, um, ma, meaning nothingness. Or well, what is it? Okay, so, so therefore, chokma. When we're talking, when 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 we're talking about the concept of the origin of things. Oh, I should scroll. Oh, there. Is that better? Okay. Got it? Everyone can see now? Okay. Uh, so, uh, when we're talking about Chokhmah, the word Chokhmah, right? The word Chokhmah is Koch and Ma. So, we are saying, therefore, Chokhmah, the Ma, the what is it, the Ma, is koach and ma the power or potential 
of something, that's called koach, and ma of nothingness, the power, the potential of nothingness. That which is unknown, the power of, the, of or potential of the unknown to inform and to bring into being chokhmah, the known. So therefore, say the, um, uh, the sages of the Kabbalah, the way a person achieves chokhmah primarily is by looking into the origin of things. By looking into the origin of things. Every event, now obviously one can spend one's entire day examining uh, the origin of everything, but it's a meditation which should take at least a few minutes of a person's day where he stops to think about what is the origin of everything above me? What is the origin of everything around me? Where is the spiritual root of this particular thing? And to start going back and sort of retracing the steps until one comes to the concept of Ein od milvado, there is nothing besides him, nothing besides God. There's nothing besides that. The ultimate ground of everything is godliness. The ultimate root of everything is God. Ein od milvado, there's nothing besides him. And that's why Chochmah, in the famous work Tanya, Tanya and Tanya, uh, chapter 35. Yeah, Tanya chapter 35 describes Chochmah as... Uh, he alone is, he alone is, uh, and, and this is, and this, there's a, there's a sort of a note in the middle of the chapter that says he alone is talking about God, and this is the level of Chokhmah. In other words, Chokhmah realizes and recognizes, and recognizes that there really is nothing besides God. And this is explained in much greater length, at much greater length, also in Tanya, in the section called uh, Shar HaYichud Ve Ha'emunah. It's explained in other places as well, but this is uh, tra- uh, Ve Ha'emunah. Uh, it's translated, it happens to be translated there into English, so it's much easier to access. Oh, Tanya, what am I doing? Tanya, right? Tanya, section title, Shara Yichwe Amuna, he speaks about this at length. He discusses this whole concept. So therefore, in order to develop wisdom, according to the Kabbalists, primarily, one has to look into the origin of things, the spiritual origins of things. What is the source of this particular thought, this particular emotion, this particular event, this particular, where is it coming from? Try and try and sort of trace it back. Now, obviously, um, there's a lot of uh, training that is necessary and a lot of concepts that one must um, absorb before being able to really um, use this very, very effectively. However, it's simply enough to concentrate, um, at least in the beginning, to concentrate on the idea that that chokhmah comes from this level of nothingness. And when, again, when we say nothingness, we don't mean that there's nothing there. It means that an, an ungrasped, incomprehensible level of godliness. This is what we said in the beginning, that when a person, um, to go back, a wise person's eyes are in his head, and the Zohar translates that as a wise person's eyes are on his head. Not in his head, but on his head. On that which dwells upon his head, the divine presence. So, because a person's wisdom illuminates his face, as we see uh, in this, in this, um, in this uh, quote from Ecclesiastes, from Kohelet, so by examining wise people, by looking at wise people and what it is that they do, 
we can get a glimpse, so to speak, of the illumination of what it is that illuminates their face, what it is that illuminates their countenance, what illuminates them. Another way of looking at it is, there's another verse, uh, which I did not um, copy down over here, but the, the, verse, the, the verse also says, that one who has chokhmah, who has wisdom, that wisdom gives him life. Those who own, who are masters of wisdom, are masters of the life within them. It gives life, it energizes those people who possess it. So to look at, when one looks at a wise person, what energizes that person? What wakes him up? What illuminates him? What lights the person up? You know, when you see a little child who, uh, you know, you show a child a lollipop, so his face will light up, right? Uh, or an ice cream or whatever it is. Yeah, his face will light up. He feels delighted that he's about to get, uh, he's about to get an ice cream. But what illuminates the face of a sage, of a wise person? What illuminates the sage of a wise person is his contemplation on the higher origin of things, the root of things up above. And that focus, that focus on there is nothing besides godliness and everything that's happening, everything, every event is happening by divine providence and by the guiding hand of God. That is what begins to illuminate the person with wisdom. Why? Because then one, to a certain extent, one lets go. Now, here we're going to come to another concept in, in, in Chochmah. There's an argument, or, or let's not call it an argument, it's a, a discussion. There's a discussion amongst the sages as to where wisdom resides. Where wisdom resides. Does it reside? Does it reside in the head or the heart? That's an argument amongst the sages, the sages of the Talmud. Does it reside in the head or in the heart? Uh, if anyone is interested, I could probably just quickly look for the source of it. Just one second. Um... I've got too many references here to be uh, to be able to tell you honestly. Um, all right, any any event, take it uh, take it take it from me that it's a it's it's a Talmudic expression, a Talmudic uh, discussion. And if anyone wants it, I can just look it up quickly um, after the class. I don't want to waste too much time. So they ask the question: Does does wisdom reside in the head or the heart? Now. The answer is both. Wisdom is in the head. In other words, wisdom is an intellectual thing, but wisdom is also an emotional thing. Wisdom is both intellectual and emotional because there's two aspects to wisdom. One aspect of wisdom, as, as we said before, one aspect of wisdom is that which sees the origin of things up above. That's the head aspect of wisdom. One aspect of wisdom is the heart aspect where it, uh, where a wise person is able to emote what other people are feeling. It's empathy. That aspect of wisdom, the lower aspect of wisdom, is called empathy. Uh, yeah, build the Mishkan and, uh, yeah, Chokhmah Belayv, yeah, that's right. They were able to, yes, they were able to um, to act according to, to build the tabernacle with the wisdom of the heart, called Chochem Leif, right. It wasn't so much as sensing the origin of things, as sensing their, uh, their, their, their fitting in with the existence of the temple below as a reflection of what was above. Now, let me just uh, explain this a little bit more. The Sefer Yetzira, the Sefer Yetzira uh, is, a, um, is an important Kabbalistic work. Uh, 
an important Kabbalistic work, which says the following, that um, Chochmah has Lamed Bet Netivot. HaChochmah. Right? Lamed Bet Netivot HaChochmah. Let me just make that a bit bigger. Um, here we go. Yeah, Lamed Bet Netivot HaChochmah. There are 32 paths of Chochmah. 32 paths of Chochmah. Now the word, the, the, the letter 32, the uh, 32 is just um, 32, right? 32 in Hebrew is spelled Lev. So that's the Chochmah of the heart. The Chochmah of the heart is not Chochmah itself, it's the path of Chochmah. What are the paths of Chochmah? If you would imagine that Chochmah is sort of the destination, then the paths leading to that destination or the paths leading away from that destination towards the world are called the 32 paths of wisdom, how wisdom branches out into the world. That's the wisdom that branches out into the heart. The lay, the Lamed Bet, the 32 are, the numerical value of 32 in Hebrew is Lev. Right? Lev meaning the heart. So these are 30, the 32 aspects of wisdom which affect the heart. In other words, they affect the emotional quality. So therefore we would say that the, um, the concept of wisdom resides both in the head and the heart. The essence of wisdom in the head or essentially above the head. In other words, it's a contemplation of what is above one. And it also resides in the heart in terms of bringing the wisdom down into emotion and then into, um, into action, into speech and action. Yes, uh, that is one of the correspondences. That's true, Martin. Correct. Okay. So, therefore, the acquisition of wisdom demands two things, just to, uh, to recap. Acquiring or um, strengthening wisdom is by, first of all, looking at the consequences of what any particular act, thought, speech, or deed is going to lead to, what could be the possible consequences. And again, this takes a lot of training. Um, that's one aspect of it. That's kind of the lower aspect of it. The so 32 that affects what's going on in the world over there around one. And then there is the deeper aspect of Chochmah. say it comes out of nothing as a contemplating and contemplation of the spirituality, which is beyond us, the spirituality, which transcends us, the presence of God, which rests upon a person who seeks to put himself or herself in sync with the divine will. That's what Chochmah Ma'ayin Temotza is all about. Uh, somebody asked the question, uh, no, first of all, Terry asked the question, knowledge is for ourselves and wisdom is for others. Again, knowledge for self-gain is different than gaining knowledge for others. Yes, correct. That is correct. Uh, wisdom, wisdom is meant not only, it, it, it's also for yourself, but for sure, it has more of an effect on others, whereas knowledge is only really for ourselves. True. Okay. Uh, 36 thanks for constantly get to Chochmah because we can go no higher than Keter. Yes, we can go no higher than Keter, but we can get to the level of the Pneumut of Keter, the inner dimension of Keter, which I didn't really uh, speak about here, but that is the concept of delight. The inner dimension of Keter is called delight, or Tanug Oineg, which corresponds to Atik Yoimin, called Atik Yoimin, Yoimin in Kabbalah, or Atik, simply Atik in uh, Kabbalah. And um, that is manifested in Chochmah. The inner, inner ayin, the inner nothingness of Chochmah is manifested in, um, uh, manifested in Chochmah as the light of the face. That what we said before, uh, a, uh, a person's wisdom illuminates his face. That's primarily the wisdom that not only comes from the first level of nothingness, but from the higher level of nothingness called Atik, the inner dimension of Keter. 
The outer dimension of Keter is called will or arich. The inner dimension of Keter is called the light. So the delight is what illuminates a person's face. When a person is in a state of delight, as you can see, his face, her face is illuminated. The illumination comes from Atik. That's why it's sometimes called Atik Yomin, the ancient of days. It brings day, it brings, it brings light, it brings illumination to the person. Uh, Zer Anpin is uh, emotions. The smaller, smaller parts of this is Atik Yomin. Zer Anpin is, uh, is an emotional uh, quality. Emotional qualities. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know I didn't give you exactly a recipe, but I gave you something to think about. So uh, that is more or less um, the conclusion. Um, okay. Is... Okay, we can leave it at that. Um, are there any questions? <laughs>